watching and anticipating the many features being presented by our lineup of speakers. As you all know by now, the past few years have been interesting, to say the least. With COVID's rampant effects, it was difficult to predict whether or not we would be able to have this event at all and have it ensue this year. But seeing we're all here, we did it. Last year's TEDx Youth event was vastly different from this year's with many last minute changes and a very hectic final week. For all of you who knew the behind the scenes, there was a lot that went into making last year's event possible and the same goes for this year. Likewise, today's event was full of planning challenges and many last minute touch ups. But through the collaborative effort of 30 plus high school students who paved the way for this event, as well as many faculty and staff, we finally come to the anticipated day. So you can all imagine that Roberto and I, along with everyone else, can't wait to get started. On to the very important part and the big question. What is this year's theme? Every event, TEDx event organizers propose a central idea that grounds the speakers being presented on today's stage. As last year's theme was bridging the gaps, Roberto and I wanted to get a little bit more creative seeing that we're focusing on women this year. For those of you who don't know, TEDx is a grassroots initiative that aims to platform and disseminate ideas worth spreading. On the other hand, TEDx Women is a branch of TEDx Talks, specifically working to move and shift the dialogue onto girls and women in a meaningful and profound way. And they're given the opportunity to propel change and disseminate ideas with platforms like the one you guys see here. Too often, women are shunned and not given the agency to speak out in the same way that their male counterparts do. And so our theme this year is breaking the glass ceiling. The glass ceiling is a colloquial term used to represent an invisible barrier that prevents a given demographic from rising beyond a certain level. This term has now been typically used to refer to women as the given demographic as the metaphor because it was first coined by feminists. And so today's topics are presented by the women of GIS. Our speakers consist of four high school students and one GIS faculty member. From grade 10, we have Miyake Suman. Miyake will be speaking about the male gaze and how opportunities with the establishment of female narratives in film. From grade 11, we have one speaker, Alex Rachmat. Alex will be talking about the good girl complex and the normalization of harmful standards that women are expected to follow. From grade 12, we have two speakers, Sophia Malika Joyanogoro and Naila Punjabi. Sophia Malika will be elaborating on women in politics and the representation that is still lacking in this arena. Nyla will be relating from her personal experiences as a bicultural woman and the effects biculturalism has on the workforce and the global community in general. As for the adult speakers, we have one just faculty member speaking today, Mrs. Erica Kali. Mrs. Kali, our high school IB theater teacher, will be focusing on how humanity stories should reflect a multifaceted narrative coming from perspectives including women who have long been excluded in storytelling and playwriting. I feel like we're ready to get started. We hope that all of you enjoy the diverse topics being presented on today's stage. Please remember to turn off any flash photography and keep your phones on silent in order to avoid interfering with the videography and microphones. Now to get on with what all you've been waiting for, please welcome our friend Rajoy to introduce the first speaker. talk about establishment of female narratives in films. as well as hearts. They've got ambition, they've got talent, as well as just beauty. I am sick of people saying that love is all a woman is fit for. Has anyone ever heard of this quote? It's a popular one said by protagonist Joe March in the 2019 film adaptation of Little Women by Greta Gerwig. And what I love about this quote was how it made me feel, how good I felt, and how truly those words resonate to what I try to achieve in this world. It was highly unexpected. It was fresh, and some might say it was controversial. After all, it was directed by a woman. One of my earliest memories was one in kindergarten class where 
um, my teacher placed a piece of paper in front of me blank along with some color pencils. And the first thing she'd ask my classroom was, what do you want to be when you grow up? I could assume many of you have been asked that question before. But while we realize that there are so many opportunities out there, my logic of it was, how do I think of a job tailored for girls that I would enjoy? And all around that room, I observed how my classmates would present them. And this is what they typically looked like. So from memory, the boys go for about astronauts, race car drivers, doctors, businessmen, and engineers, president, superhero, you know. And the girls would have teacher, princess, vet, dancer. And it was around 2009 at the time. And I feel like there had been some clear segregation with the roles. The boys was more masculine, where the girls were more feminine. And I want you to think of what we could have watched at the time that could have affected this. <coughs> Exposure to cartoons. We were watching cartoons, right? And I want you to think of the content exposure. Cartoons are films. Films tell stories. And stories are a way of communicating. At a child's developmental age, they first articulate the world through seeing and hearing before they could even read. We firstly discovered gravity, and then there I was, discovering the DVD player where I would constantly watch Snow White, Cinderella, The Little Mermaid, and what I learned from those movies in the end was Snow White's physical beauty is what saves her. Cinderella is saved from terrible living conditions, not because of how hard she's worked, but because she is beautiful. And Ariel would constantly change her physical appearances to appeal to a man without have said a single word and then married him. But at the end, they were all damsels in distress who were saved by a prince. So we could agree that it followed the same structure, only with different concepts. Girl has problem. Boy meets girl. Boy saves girl. Boy and girl live happily ever after. All of which these movies would be directed by a man. Now, I have no bad blood with, with Disney. That was a long time ago. I love Disney. But seeing how those power constructs repeat as a pattern over and over again was most likely why there was a division in stereotypes. That's why boys wanted to be superheroes or even presidents. Men were always the ones to lead or save, such as the heroic Prince Charming, Superman, Neil Armstrong, the guy who landed on the moon and saved America. What a hero, right? Though, what comes with this, and what I'd like to inoculate today is the notion that these stereotypes are influenced even more because of what we see in films and the people who are working behind them. One of the most common ways of dividing the world is through gender, most of which typically through the origins of male and female. And for centuries, it's always been that way. I'd eventually discovered the passion, a passion for the art world, and as many of you may or may not know, I am that art kid. Um, live, laugh, love art. And more specifically, I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to tell a story of passion that came from me. The problem, though, I never really paid attention to the, to the men behind the art, most of which I discovered that when you try to search up the best directors on Google, what comes up is essentially this long line of men, men, men. And that was pretty intimidating because they're, respectfully, they're extremely talented, legendary <laughs> filmmakers who have been part of a few of my favorite movies, but then the question I had to myself was, why aren't there women out there? Where are they? And I guess this takes us back to those power structures. Traditionally, the film industry has been a male-dominated one. Women do exist, but they're just ba barely making it past the independent film stage, despite making up 50% of film school enrollments today. And for centuries, movies would be made by male directors, following the portrayals of women that would still have some accounts of being subordinate because of how society was perceived. Women played a role back then. They were the ones to stay home, not be able to work, prepare the food, 
And by continuing to create these films, the ones with, that would constantly be made by men would directly elicit biases towards these one perspective. And this is what film terminology has called the male gaze. It's a pretty popular term. But for those who haven't heard, the male gaze is a term coined by Laura Malvi in 1975, essentially arguing that women, including the people of color, are put at a disadvantage. Whether that be the lack of depth or lines or scenes they are given, the way that they are put as objects of desire was the problem and how they were typically interpreted through the perspective of a heterosexual white male. This categorized to satisfy the viewer, the one on the camera and the one behind the camera. One common influence of the male gaze is that it molds a world with extremely unrealistic standards of women glamorized again, objectified, in fact, four times more likely than men to be seen in revealing clothing or even naked. I mean, take a look at the past James Bond posters. Whoops. Need I say more? There's also certain factors hindering the equal representation of women on screen. And one that I found interesting um, was called the fridging effect, which means Superheroines who have been either depowered, raped, or cut up and stuck in the refrigerator. Sounds a bit odd, but yes, it's a very common way of women to die in fiction, and it translates as the establishment of female tragedy that essentially becomes our hero's motivator in a movie. We see this to be an overdone trend that traces back to movies such as James Bond, again, Spider Man, Batman where the recently introduced girlfriend says her bye-byes before we even get to know her. I mean, come on. There aren't enough female protagonists if we keep on eliminating them this way. Despite being a form of entertainment, the film industry then shapes people's beliefs and opinions of the world and their place within it by portraying men and women a certain way. It reaffirms the misogynistic narrative of the past to the present world, how men think they should look at women, how women think they should see themselves. It was easy for my classmates and I to categorize ourselves into these harmful stereotypes because the way we perceive fictional characters in movies has a direct impact on what we expect this reality to be like. It changes our perspective, as, and, and as a result, we have unrealistic expectations. And I know that for a fact because I know it's affected me and I bet it's affected you too. Positively and negatively, films are a hypnotic art. It's influenced many parts of my personality starting from the way I dress, the way I talk to people and what tone and what inspires me. By portraying women in film from a certain and biased gaze, studies have actually found that over and over again, these objectifications have increased a, woman, a woman's negativity towards themselves. But more concerningly, it has adapted physiological effects for men, for they have adapted an idea that may perpetuate, let's just say, certain negative behaviors. And we don't want that, no. No, we do not want that. Those attitudes are a product of their time. Back in the day, that was okay, but we've moved on to say that it is not. Which is why we need to move on and create a new directive. And we could start here. Three words. You ready for this? Incorporating more women. In the case of eliminating gender stereotypes, Incorporating more women is a vital first step in increasing a female's long-term presence on television and changing how we think about women in our culture. This is a movement towards adequately representing the female subjectivity and desire on screen. And that starts with the storyteller, the director, the keeper of the story. We don't see that many female directors for starters because margins of females working in film are still very stretched. Women aren't given enough opportunities to express themselves. And to put that in context, only 4% of them directed big budget films in 2018 that had, had stayed static up until 2019, where the numbers have tripled to 12% regarding the feminist movement. 
Finally, we compromised 16% of directors working in the top 100 grossing films of 2020. The good news is that of those minuscule growth of numbers, the ratio of 16 to 100, this year in 2021, we celebrate the first ever woman of color, Chloe Zhao, to ever win an Oscar's Best Picture for her remarkable film, Nomadland. Yes, yes. The film follows a um, sexagenarian woman who accepts the life of a modern-day nomad after losing everything in the Great Recession. It was just a wonderful movie that completely disregards the stereotypes and introduces you to this entirely unique realm of people and nature. The question is, how could she have won against the majority of directors who were nominated that day? Did you know that she was one out of five? What is it that we had to offer? <coughs> well, at the end, what Nomadland has taught me was that you do not need to own anything to see the meaning and love in life. What Greta Gerwig's Little Woman, as said previously, had taught me that despite the patriarchy, women have brilliance in themselves. And even if that was a long time ago. But what these two movies have in common are not only female directors, but female protagonists that bring out the three-dimensional versions of themselves. One that focuses on their spirit, their soul that is realistic, inspiring, and subverts the male gaze. Women make up 49.58% of our global population today, so imagine how nice it felt to see more representation for a change. In fact, Analysis coming from earlier this year also found that female-led Oscar films were more profitable than, than their male-led counterparts. So I think that just proves another point. But I think this is a brilliant achievement. Seeing how well these movies have done to prove to the world that women are, they have already had strength, but it's just about the way the world perceives them. And while recognizing the urgency and imbalance, last month, Sundance Film Festival had announced Joanna Vicente as their new CEO. I don't know if you've heard, but she took advantage of her position to advocate for what is urgent. And as a woman herself, I'd observed how she's opening more opportunities and doors to film through incorporating more gender, diversity in race, sexuality, and just overall more representation emphasized, especially in their LinkedIn page. Um, because of that open door, it has become an opportunity for those who differ to show who they are inside and not outside. Those are sort of the initiatives needed to help people like me get to where they want to be without this underlying fear of unethical hassles regarding stereotypical female stigmas. I want to see and make movies, many in the mere future, that blur the lines between gender stereotypes. And it all begins here. Cinema is a part of growth and education. It's an extremely important way to deliver ideas, one that is fresh, one that is new, one that is exciting. As a modern society, our jobs is to conjure the best of other people within their skills, perseverance, instead of our differences. To the people watching me today, everybody, if there weren't any realistic role models we could look up to, where are we going to find meaning? Where are we going to find consolation, a sense of morality? Women have minds, they have souls as well as hearts. They've got ambition, they've got talent, as well as just beauty. Let's project that onto our growing generations, to the little boys and girls, to our families and friends. These numbers and actions have taken the filming industry to a whole new purpose, that is to promote better equality, especially for women. Plenty of works coming from female directors have showed us the importance of representation, from races to ultimately gender. Because cinema is a medium of change and influence to our society. And when we start influencing change in our narratives, 
we create opportunities. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Miyake, for the wonderful talk on female empowerment in the film industry. Next up is Sophia Malika, who will be discussing why Indonesia needs more female representation in politics. Please welcome her onto the stage. I come from a long line of strong, independent women. My mother established her own law firm, my grandmother raised three kids, my great-grandmother created her own catering business. And I'd like to think that I'm growing to become a strong, independent woman myself as well. It feels like a torch that's being passed on, a fire sparked through each generation. I'm so beyond proud to be the next. There's just one problem. The world despises us. It's a hard pill to swallow, and I've had it fed to me bit by bit. I first realized in kindergarten, I know, for those of you that can see me today, it might not seem like a long time ago, but it was, and it left a lasting impression on me. Because you see, I was that kid, the overachiever, the type A student, the girl that would finish her reading log three weeks in advance, the girl that would raise her hand every time the teacher asked a question and then raise it a bit in the air so the teacher would, so she would make sure the teacher could see her. I know. A bit annoying, but I was a hard worker and I was confident. I read the books, I knew the answers, it was just who I was. One day, though, I was in a group project. We had to construct an imaginary animal. Ours was an antstrich, a combination of an ant and an ostrich, if you're wondering. And I was instructing my groupmates on how to glue gun its legs. I heard one groupmate whisper to the other, she's so bossy. To be honest, I was shocked and I was hurt. I didn't know people thought of me like that. I thought I was just doing my own thing, trying to get a good grade. I didn't realize people disliked me for it. I felt like I was hated for just trying to do my best. And as I grew up, devouring history and books and fiction, I realized that this is a really common pattern. Whenever women are in power, they're bossy, ambitious, over-controversial. When men are in the same position, they're role models, driven, assertive. Obviously, my example was kind of trivial, and I was definitely a bit annoying, but this happens on so many different degrees. Really, it dates back to hundreds of years ago. In ancient Greece, for example, with Circe, who was called a witch for turning the men who raped her into pigs. In ancient Egypt, with Cleopatra, a very rare female pharaoh who was seen as a seductress and a control freak. Or now, in modern-day America, with Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama, AOC, who all have their share of controversies, but are always scrutinized more and always have more hurdles simply because they are powerful women. Or even in pop culture, Taylor Swift, who is literally a trend to hate, Yoko Ono, who is still being blamed for a whole group of adult men's actions, or Britney Spears, who was a recent survival of intense societal misogyny. Because the truth is, as much as it hurts to admit, powerful women have always been villainized. This means two things. First, is that powerful women are shamed into being weak. Because personally, I was embarrassed. After bossy gate, I toned down my bossiness, my ambition, and it is so easy to second-guess yourself as a woman. It's something I'll always regret, shifting who I was, watering myself down for the sake of society's comfort. But it doesn't mean that there are no powerful women. Of course, women persevere, women fight. I've changed, I've accepted who I am. The bigger, the bigger problem that happens is that these powerful women aren't seen. I remember studying national heroes in Indonesian history class. We had to memorize 20 different national heroes, all of them who have served our country with respect and honor, who blazed a path for independence, all who have monuments dedicated in their honor. All of the men. And I asked my teacher, why don't we study a few women? Why don't we mix it up? Why don't we have any women national heroes that we're studying in class? The teacher didn't really have an answer because this is the educational norm. In school curriculums with teachers and students, even in dining tables with parents and children, powerful women are often left out of the conversation. This creates catastrophic effects, because when powerful women are hated, the only way they are valued is when they are submissive. 
There are so many ways to explain this or explain why it happens, but I found the best way is through myth. Ancient Greeks believed humans once had four arms, four legs, and two heads. But fearing their power, the gods split them into two, condemning them to spend the rest of their lives searching for their other halves to finally be complete. But let's modify that myth a little bit. After all, we're in Indonesia, not ancient Greece. And in Indonesia, the man is not half of himself. He is not longing, he is not searching, he is already complete. The women, however, are a completely different story. Perhaps to compensate for her partner's lack of wanting, her entire life's purpose is finding her other half. She is longing, she is searching, she is incomplete. This imbalance has nothing to do with biology and everything to do with society. Because Indonesian women are forced to believe in a fairy tale. One where to get the happy ending they are told to crave, rings must be worn and vows must be changed. They are told that marriage is a prize. We are told that marriage is a purpose. So much so that people are willing to sacrifice anything to force women to get it. Indonesia has had a long, long battle with, against child marriages. According to UNICEF, before 2019, one in four Indonesian girls were pushed to marry before they turned 18. Indonesia has also had a long, long battle with domestic violence, and the pandemic, unfortunately, has only exacerbated those harms. Oftentimes, women are pressured by friends and family to stay in these abusive marriages because divorce is taboo. At the core of this issue is what every burgeoning society seems to struggle with. Many of our societal institutions are rooted in patriarchy. The household, for example, where, and I'm speaking very generally here, men are expected to be breadwinners and women are expected to stay at home. This also is often dated back to the institution of colonialism, which has had a long history of repressing women's freedoms for the sake of creating societal hierarchies. There's so many possible answers, so many threads that I can trace back, but these are uncertain questions with uncertain answers. What we know for sure is the impact this brings, because it trickles down from big issues to small lives. I grew up having to learn self-defense out of fear of sexual harassment. I grew up walking down the streets with headphones on out of fear of strange men talking to me. I'm a powerful woman who, like so many others, have been taught to be afraid. Because put quite simply, Indonesia, like the majority of the global community, has deep patriarchal roots that haven't been eradicated. Okay, maybe that wasn't so simple. But the point is, women are silenced. We are constantly on the defense that we can't be on the offense. We are told we cannot be powerful. And then the perennial question becomes, how do we fix this? How do we eradicate those roots? My answer is that we need more powerful women to be seen. And we need them starting from the very top. Which brings me to the world that women need to infiltrate. Politics. I know. I know. This starts to raise a lot of different questions, whens and whats and whos. Let me answer them. The one I get most often by my fellow countrymen is why. They say, do we really? Haven't we already had a female president? I say, yeah, Ibu Megawati. But that is exactly the point, because the hubris that Indonesia has in using Ibu Mega or other female politicians in proving that they are equal to women is what lessens the visibility of the problem. These are amazing women, but they are still a rarity. We need more, and we need to talk about them more. And then, I say all of the wonderful things that women have done for Indonesia, and there's so many examples to reach for here. Sri Mulyani, for example, our current Minister of Finance, the first Indonesian to be the Managing Director of the World Bank, credited with severely strengthening the Indonesian economy and steering Southeast Asia through the global financial crisis. Or Chuknyak Dien, who was a leader of the Achenese guerrilla forces during the Aceh War. After her husband died, she led guerrilla actions against the Dutch for 25 years, and she was heralded as a national hero in 1964. Or lastly, brought in Ajahn Kartini. At the young age of 24, under Dutch colonial rule, she started a school for 10 girls, girls who didn't have access to any sort of education. She channeled her own privilege as a noble to gain feminist knowledge and utilize connections. She sent reforms, letters, and protests to the government for equal education. She once wrote, and I absolutely love this quote, all our tears now will help form the seed from which flowers will one day bloom for the next generation. I hope she's right. It is these women and so, so much more that I wish we could have learned about in school. 
And finally, I say, imagine all the things that they could do now, policies that help women. For example, a clear bill that encapsulates all types of sexual assault, or more hotlines and police departments dedicated to helping domestic violence victims, or more female perspective that just brings so much to the table, because it shifts the understanding of how law can be utilized to protect women. It can genuinely change lives. More women being at the seat of power is something that would create rapid change in any society. In a place that hates powerful women so much, isn't this, with positive changes being created, the way to really show how amazing powerful women are? Isn't this where we show how else women can be valued? But the second question, and the one that is much, much harder to answer, is how? Because it's so easy to say more and more without asking why and how. That second word, how, was the roadblock that I experienced. I knew we needed more women. I knew why we needed more women. I just didn't know how. There have been so many answers to this. First of all, quotas. Currently, a 30% female quota is required for any political party within their list of legislative candidates. But results from the 2010 and 2014 elections show they're not actually elected. Only 20% of the House are women. This is a small incremental boost from the previous term, 17%. So, yeah, quotas work. We have 20% of women in the House, but it's not as much as we need them to. I think the answer lies in the individual. First and foremost, women. We need more women running. But this is so much harder than it sounds. And it's so much harder to just tell a woman you should run for office. Because the entire world, from mythical legends to classmates to your own family, tell us that men are supposed to take charge and women are just supposed to step back. It's a cognitive dissonance for women. When all our lives we are taught to be convenient, it is unthinkable to create an uproar, to do something unexpected, to be inconvenient. I'm here to tell these women that it's okay to break the glass ceiling. I'm talking to the women that have been called controversial, bossy, ambitious. Forget all of that. You are you. You are a future leader. Secondly, voters. Because even when women run, oftentimes they're not elected. It's easier for voters to get wrapped up in the societal perceptions that are told to them as well. And even when voters do vote for women, there are perceptions of women in politics that try to fit them into a box even more. Researchers Huddy and Tickledon notice that female candidates are better seen as being better equipped to discuss compassion issues, women's issues, education, healthcare, social, social welfare, civil liberties. Men are viewed as better on issues such as military and defense and foreign policy and the economy. This obviously isn't true. Both can talk about the other. But it can be so easy to drown in the voices of the opposition and the societal narratives that are taught to you since you were a little kid. But women are capable. Women are strong. And powerful women should be heralded as the change makers that they are. As voters, it is our duty to remember this. But honestly, I don't think I can come up with a perfect answer. For once, I am not rapidly answering the question the teacher asked. Because I don't think a 15-minute speech can answer problems so deeply ingrained in our society. But I do think we can start thinking about it. Because every single change of action, every single change in our history has been lit by the very, very smallest of fires. The fight for women's education started with 10 girls, led by Cartini. The fight for freedom started with a group of 20-year-olds and the Pledge of the Youth. And the fight for our future, it starts with every one of us. If we want to change the future, we have to do it ourselves. I think we can. I think we will. And here's where I want to deal with the possibility of failure. Because sometimes women just won't get elected. Sometimes policies just won't get ratified. What happens then? What happens now? As usual, there's lots of ways to explain this. But I found the best way is through a story. I recently volunteered at a nonprofit composed of lawyers who help women with domestic violence cases. There, over the course of a couple months, I was exposed to raw vulnerability. Faces frozen in perpetual fear, tear-streaked cheeks, bruised bodies. But I also saw intense resolve. After learning their options, armed by the law, I see a flame ignited. Faces sculptured by determination, eyes glinting with hope instead of tears, bodies attuned to fight instead of flight. As they start the crusade for justice, hurdles come. Husbands deny. Their cases are chipped, yet the resolve resists. 
hours are dedicated to collecting testimonies. Lawyers sacrifice time to help victims through the breakdowns they inevitably experience. Some cases don't go the way they should. The jury was swayed, the gavel struck. Women lose yet again. But in the end, no matter the outcome of the law, the grievances of justice, these women come out stronger. They're able to accept they've tried their best, able to stomach yet another injustice. The community they have built around them, volunteers and family and friends, is a blanket to soften yet another blow. Now, the bruises are a mark of survival, not weakness. After hundreds of cases, I'm left asking, when will women win? Broken systems, unfair odds, it seems hopeless. But more than anything, these women have shown me strength. It is with this unwavering resolve that the crusade for justice, for reform, persists. No matter how long it takes, because we are not afraid anymore. It is the strength and the and this independence that wins above all. The fire has been lit within us, and it cannot be snuffed. Thank you. Do I, have, do I have to turn them off? Thank you so much. You did so good too. I was shaking so much of no idea. No, because it's like scary, but it's okay. You did so good. Talk about her experience of being a bicultural woman. have you heard the phrase that culture should be embraced? That diversity should be accepted? That being exposed to different cultures makes you a more understanding and open-minded individual? In essence, this is true. Culture is in fact an integral part of one's identity, powerful enough to shape countries and enlighten people with purpose and belonging. However, reaping the benefits of culture can prove to be extremely difficult, especially if you are a bicultural woman. As the name suggests, bicultural individuals are from two different cultures. I myself am of Indian descent, but my nationality is Indonesian. I am vegetarian on Mondays and Thursdays because I am Hindu, something many people find quite peculiar. Yet, on Wednesdays and Fridays, I find myself devouring sate soto or beef rendang, traditional Indonesian dishes I highly recommend you try if you haven't already. I love and appreciate both my Indian and Indonesian identities, but it wasn't always that easy. Being bicultural can influence an individual's mental and social well-being. At first glance, it may seem like being part of more than one culture just means that you have more people to hang out with, more groups to relate to. However, the adaptation to different cultural frames, also known as frame switching, is often perceived negatively. A study by York University PhD graduate Alexandria West found that frame-switching bicultural people are seen as inauthentic and in turn are seen as less likable, less trustworthy, and not as warm or competent in comparison to do those who do not frame-switch. This research points to the sources of conflict, specifically the perceived differences about people with multiple cultural backgrounds. So you may ask, if people are getting judged for frame switching, why don't they just stop doing so? After all, frame switching entails changing your actions and your behaviors in order to match those around you, right? Well, not exactly. Frame switching is a dynamic process that occurs when individuals access culture-specific mental modules or practically change their entire perception of the world. Frame switching is unconscious, and it's natural, too. Rather than a means of fitting in, frame switching is a way for individuals to express different parts of their cultural identities, and rightfully so. 
When I was little, I tied Krupuk to a string on August 17th to celebrate Indonesia's independence. I played chongklak with my family. But I also celebrated Diwali and watched Bollywood movies. Granted, I had to read the English subtitles to understand. Years later, when I reminisced about Kalhona Ho with my Indian friends, they found it offensive that I had to read the subtitles to understand. My childhood experiences and means to learn about my culture through a cinematic lens was taken as an inauthentic way to become more Indian. So talking to my Indian friends about Bollywood movies was my form of frame switching. I had watched several of these movies, and each one had further shaped my own perspective of Indian culture. So during a conversation about Indian traditions, it felt natural for me to reference these timeless tales. However, this was perceived negatively. Clearly, bicultural individuals face stigmatization on a day-to-day -day basis, but for bicultural women, this problem is amplified, as this minority group is handed a direct disadvantage in the workplace. A study conducted by Working Mother Media President Sava Berry found that 62% of multicultural women believe that their race or their culture is a disadvantage. 74% of bicultural women believe that they are not considered to fit the profile of a leader. And 63% of early career multicultural women hope to make it to the top, whereas only 41% of late career multicultural women have these same aspirations. Now, what these numbers mean is that bicultural women must fight against their surroundings, working twice as hard to gain access to the same opportunities that others simply take for granted. What these numbers mean is that bicultural women are filled with hope and potential for the rest of their professional careers, but are shot down by discrimination for the rest of society. These bicultural women start off proud and ambitious, but as they grow, many unfortunately start to view as their identity as a disadvantage. This stigma surrounding dichotomous cultural female identities is also paired with internal difficulties as one faces contrasting values and incompatible norms. Allow me to explain. Three generations ago, my great-grandparents migrated to Indonesia during the India-Pakistan partition. They lived near the Kashmir border in a province called Sindh, hence, we are Sindhi people. My place of origin is now part of Pakistan. Living in Indonesia for several generations, never having, to been, having been to India or Pakistan myself, I identify most strongly as Indonesian, but my grandparents, who live in the same household as me, remain strongly attached to their Indian identities. You could call me Indonesian, Indian, Sindhi, or a combination of all three. Yet this jagged fusion further complicates the list of expectations for a woman of my cultural identity. Every Karwachad, Indian wives fast for their husbands. Yet living in Indonesia, a Muslim-dominated country, I learn about the shared familial experience through Ramadan. My Indian culture told me it was okay to drink water while fasting and that only women had to fast for their husbands. Yet, my Indonesian identity taught me about the benefits of communal periods of fasting. A part of me believes that when love is equal, fasting should be done for each other. Should I consider it fair for just women to fast for their husbands? Traditional Indonesian Muslim women should never show their stomachs. In fact, many Indonesian neighborhoods strongly impose women to wear jilbabs or head coverings, as you can see here. In rural areas, this culture is enforced to the extent that women are not even allowed to go to school unless they are wearing head coverings. Yet in India, on Diwali or other cultural celebrations, a large portion of the female population wears lengas or saris, traditional clothing that leaves the stomach exposed. So what do I wear? 
These examples of cultural conflict are specific to women because women are held to a much more restrictive set of standards than men. You all have probably heard of double standards within Asian cultures, but even within my two Asian backgrounds, the differing gender norms spur conflict. My parents, who I consider to be fairly modern, still feel that it is for my brother to do certain things, for not, but not for me. Dating openly, for example, is quite culturally taboo in women among Sindhi households, but somehow not as much for men. Indonesians don't as strictly differentiate between the genders, and JIS students certainly don't as well. An investigation into the bicultural life experience of career-oriented black women found living in the United States found that the women perceive themselves as living in two distinct cultural contexts, one black and one white. The women compartmentalize different aspects of their lives in order to ma manage their complex cultural dimensions. Additionally, the study found that these women tend to have highly complex life structures. These women are struggling between their African and American, black and white, or native and assimilated identities. Morals and customs overlapped, which leaves people feeling torn and trapped between two barriers. Some may also describe this dichotomy as identity confusion, specifically a personal psychosocial conflict that involves confusion about one's social role and a perceived lack of continuity to one's personality. I strive to be respectful to both my Indian and my Indonesian identities. I want to be a proud Hindu and Sindhi woman who also holds an Indonesian passport, but the inevitable truth is that this blend of different ethnic groups spurs conflict. Negotiating this bicultural labyrinth may seem overwhelmingly impossible at first. How can one possibly adapt to all these different cultural dimensions while fighting discrimination in the professional world? But when you look at it through the perspective of sorting through your personal preferences, everything starts to fall into place. The key is not to consciously change your own personality, but to first feel confident enough within your own skin, then to seek solace in the people who admire and respect your different cultural identities. So even if I was exposed to strict forms of Indonesian fasting, it is still my personal choice to fast. Even if I was exposed to full coverings, I can still choose what I want to wear while remaining my own personal sense of decency. As a woman, we face additional pressure due to strict and unwavering cultural expectations. But this also means that as women, we must fight to set aside these pressures and trust ourselves. I can't possibly tell you what's right and what's wrong with your cultural identity, but I can tell you with full confidence that you have the power to make these decisions yourselves. In order to take agency as a bicultural woman, I have not only accepted, but embraced both my cultural identities. I'm entirely aware of external expectations, but still stand by my own personal decisions. This mindset makes me a more empathetic, open-minded, and well-adjusted individual. Granted, I still turn to my parents and my community members when I'm confused about specific practices and specific traditions. But most importantly, I continuously trust myself to shape my own identity. To those of you that strongly align with your cultural values, remember, just remember to trust yourselves. There is no one right answer to the question of whether a Sindhi living in Indonesia, such as myself, should most strongly identify as Indonesian, Indian, or even Pakistani. On a larger, more corporate scale, Companies can be more inclusive by building a stronger support system for bicultural women so that they can honestly and openly express themselves. 
Specifically, companies can partner with external organizations to identify whether or not bicultural women feel comfortable in the workplace through anonymous surveys that facilitate discussion and prompt change. Diversity and inclusion events, both within the organization and outside the workforce, can also help women feel more comfortable. Having a strategic network of mentors and supporters is proven to have a positive impact on the workplace for multicultural women. On a more interpersonal level, bicultural women would be happier if they stopped comparing themselves to other people and did not define culture by a strict set of characteristics. As Dr. West says, what we need is to better understand how we can break away from external influences and compre comprehend the authenticity of people and their identities. Let me leave you all with one last example. At GIS, there is a very specific set of standards associated with being Indian. This community may speak fluent Hindi and know every single Bollywood song. They may reference timeless tales and movies that I myself am not familiar with. But this by no means determines whether or not I am Indian. My Indian heritage refers to tying a red thread on my brother's wrist every Raksha Bandhan and sitting by the stoves making lolas with my grandmother. My celebrations and my traditions may be different than those of a typical Indian, but that is completely okay. Everyone has a slightly different interpretation of culture, but that's what ultimately makes culture so special. So today, I hope you all understand that only you can define your culture. Whether or not you are perfectly aligned with your cultural community, you are in charge of your own identity. Bicultural women face a continuous stream of obstacles in order to gain the same opportunities that others are directly handed. These glass boxes can be difficult to break through. Trust me, I'd know. But ultimately, not only accepting, but embracing who you are regardless of how you fit in comparison to those around you, is truly enlightening. Thank you. Oh my God. Thank you, Nyla, for your talk on the sorry, external and sorry. internal conflicts bicultural women have. We will now have a 10-minute intermission in which Tri-M will perform two pieces for us. Tri-M is the Music Honor Society at the Jakarta Intercultural School. And those who are watching in person, bathrooms are located in the back. Thank you. Oh my god. That was so bloody stressful, dude. I messed up so much. I literally can't breathe. I can't breathe. Dude, I messed up so much. And did you see I lost my place at one point? Oh my god, that was so fucking stressful. I know, I know, I know. Dude, I literally lost my place. Oh my god. That was so stressful. I was just like, I was just like, Oh my god. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Tiff. Thank you, Kay. Have you ever felt like okay? Was there? Have you ever felt that. forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear, like you could fall and no one would hear? Well, let the lonely feeling wash away.
that the sun comes streaming in Cause you reach up and you rise again If you only look around You will be found And when our children tell their story They tell the story of time No matter what they tell you Tomorrow there'll be more of us Telling the story of tonight The story of
Nice, we got it. I think we got it. I'm just starting this one. Did you do you need it? It's fine. So I'm gonna pre I'm gonna But inside Can't seem to fix my mood Today it's as dark as my roots If I, if I ever let them Grow out <sighs> Now all of my oceans have real tides Can't seem to find what's wrong The whole world is letting me down Early 2000s seem so far away. Hey, 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 hey. Ladies, begin your sun salutations, transcendental in your meditations.
Generations, Pluto and Scorpio Generation My name is Arka Kali, and I like to tell stories. Moment one. In the heartbeats in rhythm, together, people sitting, anticipating theater, watching the same thing. To empathize, we learn together in the same moment, waiting for a moment of connection in which our stories, all stories, begin to merge. But then, if I don't see myself in the story, the reflection is incomplete. The story is then, as he is, central, just as she's a supporting role. To the side. Mighty sword, slay the dragon, save the princess, fight the giant. She's out, not in the picture, her voice. And his we hear. When is she even there? Ever since the beginning of time, people have been telling stories. It was a verbal tradition first, passed down from generation to generation, sharing family histories, legacies, myths. You can imagine it, a multi-generational family sitting around a fire in the evening, everyone a part of the storytelling, the elders teaching the younger ones the tradition, sharing stories that spoke to the hows and whys of the universe, putting things into context that would ultimately allow for understanding in a time before Google or Wikipedia, before ebooks or the printing press. Then it began to be written down. And while everyone, you can imagine everyone, male, female, young, old, all had been part of the sharing of the stories, once they began to be written down, a lot of these stories were lost. Probably because often only the men had the means by which to write, the education that enabled them to translate their myths and verbal histories to the page, and societies which upheld men's stories above others. So it was their stories that survived. The others had been lost. But what happens when only half of humanity is able to share their stories? We begin to see only the reflections of half our history, a skewed image of the whole picture, 
in which only half the story and half of humanity is represented. And if we only see a part of the whole picture, we're not seeing the whole story. Theater is about telling, all about telling stories, the sharing of them, the empathizing with them, the moments that get seared into our brain. And in the theater, the possibilities are endless. Each character brings a new perspective. Each character brings new information, without which we wouldn't have the whole, the whole story. And you can show the same moment in many different ways. You can layer it with light. And you can add sound. All of which enables you to build on a moment and fill out and complete the picture, which with, even without a word being spoken, has the power to communicate an idea so clear and stunning it can stay with you long after everything else is forgotten but that one moment. And with live theater, there is a power in the connection between the performers and the audience, unique to that art form. And as there is an understanding that comes from being present in the space while a story is being told, in full knowledge that that moment is ephemeral and fleeting and will never be performed or experienced in the same exact way again. It's live storytelling, bringing us back to our roots when we all sat around the fire thousands of years ago in a moment of connection. But what happens to that connection if we experience stories in which we have no context? In the, if the way we understand the world isn't being reflected, how then are we able to connect to what's happening, to make meaning for ourselves and our world? Since the very beginning, stories, whether verbal or visual, spoken into the night, around the fire, or painted on the cave walls, have helped us make sense of our world whether it was learning to anticipate the change of the seasons or the movement of the planets, long before we could really understand what was going on, even then, it was essential that we saw ourselves represented in order to gain understanding and to recognize our roles in the larger story and the way in which we connect to all humanity. For too long, the canon of literature that we've been exposed to in our lit classes has been from the male perspective particularly the white Anglo-Saxon male. And so the stories have reflected that perspective. Most often, it was the hero's journey that we were reading about, a hero who at one point, young, naive, and flawed, now having encountered countless dangers on his journey, is celebrated as the conquering hero. <laughs> We've heard a lot of that story. We've studied, discussed, entertained that perspective for centuries. Occasionally, we'd have an Afro Ben, or a Jane Austen, or a Mary Shelley, or Bronte's sister, and even then, it wasn't until centuries later that stories written by women of color would be added to the list. Zora Neale Hurston, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, Isabel Allende, Jumba Lahiri, to Amy Tan. But these have been exceptions, as the vast majority of the stories that we've been encountering and engaging with have been stories written by mostly white men and have highlighted the stories of conquerors, of colonization, in pursuit of power, wealth, legacy. But what does that teach us of humanity, of each other, of how to treat each other and engage with each other? Isn't it time for us to start learning from and engaging with stories that teach us other aspects of the human experience? Of how to cultivate and mend brokenness and in ourselves and others, and how to build up and restore instead of just learning how to de de destroy and demolish. Throughout the vast majority of stories that we've been exposed to in our classes or on screen, and yes, even in the theater, the stories have been written, produced, and directed by men. From a study conducted in 2019 by tech entertainment company Production Pro, 87% of Broadway directors were male, only 24% of chore uh, choreographers, and 13% of writers identified as female. In fact, we only had one female director of a musical on Broadway that year, Rachel Chavkin, who won, her, won a Tony for her direction of Hades Town that year. 
Gender disparity runs rampant in industries across the board, and the theater industry is no different. But wait a second, what is going on? Aren't women known as the great communicators? Aren't they known for those soft skills like empathy, sensitivity, intuition, multitasking? All skills that we know will become more and more essential in the 21st century and, and have always been essential in the telling of a good story. And yet our stories are still not center stage. We have to fight harder and longer to move the spotlight onto our half of the story. Because if we're only getting one part, one perspective of the story, we're not getting all of it. We've heard lots about the conquering hero, but what about those he's conquered? How much more would we understand about ourselves and our world? How much more connected could we be if we'd heard those stories? Think about it. What if we'd heard a bit of the story from the perspective of someone who joined our hero on his quest, or watched him from the beach as his ship sailed for unknown lands? And it's not as if these stories haven't been written. They have been for centuries. It's just they haven't been made central. They haven't been given the same time and space and attention. In the play The Trojan Women, originally written in 415 BC, ancient Greek playwright Euripides tells the story of the women left behind after their husbands had been killed and their city sacked. But how many of us know that story? The story of Troy in the Trojan War, and even the years that followed with Odysseus and beyond, yes, most of us are at least somewhat familiar with those stories, the women left behind, and what they did to attempt to rebuild from the ashes left after the wars had burnt their city and their homes to the ground, we are generally not as aware of that part of the story. But this, too, we need. We need to hear and connect to and relate to ha what happens after the destruction in order to find a phoenix rising from the ashes for those times in, in which we're looking for hope after the battle, after the loss, and post-pandemic. It's not that we need to leave out the journey or the quest or the battle, but we need balance. It's not just destruction, fight, kill, conquer, win. <laughs> There's so much more to humanity. We need stories that push back against destruction towards restoration and growth and renewal. And it's not like no one has been wanting or needing these stories to be shared. In fact, in many cases, they've already been written. It's just we haven't been holding them up. We haven't been giving them space. Black female American novelist and playwright Alice Childress wrote her play, Trouble in Mind, which speaks to racism, identity, and ego in New York theater 66 years ago, in 1955. But it wasn't until this October in 2021 that her play finally opened on Broadway. So how are we going to find our way back to connection and growth and hope if we're only getting the story from one perspective, from one side that has dominated center stage? We can start by making a conscious effort to make informed and intentional choices, whether it's selecting which shows to watch on Netflix or plunking down a rather hefty amount of cash to see a Broadway show. Know where you're investing your time and your money. Who wrote and directed the show you're planning to watch? Who produced it? Do they represent strong female voices, and are they committed to narrowing the gender gap? All it will require is just a minute or two of research, just a minute or two of a bit more consideration before choosing where we'll spend our time and our money and which voices we're choosing to listen to. One reason why the entertainment industry is so unlikely to invest in female directors, writers, or producers is because historically their projects don't make as much money as those written, produced, and directed by men. So they're not getting produced. But that's where we come in. We need to commit to giving our time and money to films and plays that were written and produced by women and others who value inclusion and are committed to telling stories that include a range of voices so we can start changing the landscape of what is being deemed lucrative. If money speaks, then we need to start communicating that we want those, those voices represented. We need those stories to be shared. And in your lit classes, you can also begin to make changes by simply looking over the texts that you're being assigned. Does the list reflect the diversity in your classroom? Or is it favoring one gender or one race? And if these texts do not re reflect diverse voices, use this as a point of discussion. Question these choices and make it suggestions for alternatives that are more inclusive and represent a range of perspectives and stories. 
Suggestions for alternatives are not hard to find. In just a quick search online, you can find a list of novels and playtexts that represent a wide range of perspectives. Take the Kilroy's list, for example, at kilroys.org, which is where I usually begin my search for new plays. Each year, they put out a list of 30 to 40 top plays written by women, trans, and non-binary authors of a variety of races and ethnicities. And it is where I found some of the most current and engaging texts I have read and produced. There's so much more to the story, so many more lives and experiences that represent who we are. There's so much more to humanity. So we need all stories, all perspectives represented. It's kind of like throwing ingredients into a recipe. If you're missing essential ingredients, the cake's going to come out wrong. It's going to taste off. You'll have too much of one flavor and not enough of another to balance it out. Yet, if we've never known what it's supposed to taste like, we've never experienced it as it was intended to be because we've always left out the salt or the caramel or the coconut, we may need not even be aware of what's been missing. But there's so much more. We want to experience the full intended flavor. We want the whole cake, the full story. So we need both sides. Whether it's on the page or the stage or the screen, we need all sides, all perspectives represented in order to see ourselves and our multifaceted humanity reflected in the stories we share and the stories we engage in. No longer should it be one directional. We need to flip the script. There even she is, when we hear his and her voice in the picture, not out. She's the giant. Fight, princess, save the dragon to slay. Mighty sword to the side, a supporting role. She's just as central as he is. Then the story is complete. In the reflection is myself in the story. If I don't see, but then begin to merge all stories in which are stories of connection for a moment, waiting in the same moment, together we learn to empathize the same thing, watching theater, anticipating people sitting together. In rhythm beats the heart in one moment. Thank you. for sharing your insights and experience in the theater industry and how we need to flip a script. Our next and final speaker will be Alex, whose talk is about the harmful nature of the good girl complex. Please welcome her onto the stage. the good girl complex, the mentality that forms as a result of social interactions and behaviors and expectations that tells us as women that we need to exemplify this good girl persona to get the validation that hearing this phrase gives us. Good, of course, is a word with positive connotations. The Cambridge Dictionary defines it as meaning very satisfactory, enjoyable, pleasant, or interesting. 
And thus, hearing this phrase is easily tied to affirmations, and it generally just has nice connotation. When we listen to our elders, follow instructions, act affectionately and gently, are always happy and polite, and most importantly, don't fight back, we're told that we're being good girls. Yes, these are all traits and actions that seem great to have and perform at first, but when we take a closer look at, can just be harmful for women. It teaches us from a young age, from even the very simple act of giving up that toy we really wanted to play with in kindergarten to someone else just because they seem to want it a little bit more, that we can and we should sacrifice our own wants for those of others. And this phrase and its implications ties into many of the roles that are normally assigned to women in society. Being the housewife, caring for the children while the husband goes to work, being personal health caretaker, and generally other nurturing jobs. Being called a good girl doesn't just leave it at that though. This phrase also tells us that, hey, when we do fit into this neatly and nicely constructed little box of what a good girl should be, when we follow orders and bite our tongue, we are gonna get praised too. So we start to associate certain behaviors with the positive reinforcement we get from this phrase. And then we just keep doing them over and over and over again. For example, if a woman is being openly made fun of in front of her friends, they may know that talking or replying isn't seen as good. So they just sit, listen, take it, maybe even laugh it off. Embodying this good girl attitude, even when it's not really good or frankly, even healthy for them just to be sitting on their emotions. Now, this may not be as big of a problem in society if all genders were treated the same way. If women weren't the only ones subconsciously associating a submissive set of actions with a certain phrase. But the fact is, this particular list of standards including items such as being good, always meaning, expressing, and having these really positive emotions all the time, pretty much only applies to women. The American Psychology Association reports that psychologist Sandra Thomas describes this as a product of gender socialization. UNICEF defines gender socialization as a process by which individuals develop, refine, and learn to do gender through internalizing gender norms and rules as they interact with key agents of socialization, such as their family, social networks, and other social institutions. Now, Dr. Thomas says that this phenomenon has made emotional expression vastly different between men and women. Men, on one hand, have been told that they should be open with their anger, especially deal with it physically. And it's seen as something that is more manly and masculine, and therefore, it's acceptable for them. They're unconfined, there's absolutely no ceiling or restraint holding them back from expressing the anger that they may feel. But she says, on the other hand, that women are more encouraged to repress their anger. Anger is seen as a more unfeminine emotion, and so they are told to deal with it more passive aggressively. We might not be able to even tell or even see it, but there's this glass ceiling that over the years we've formed over our own heads. One that tells us that we should hold off from saying how we feel, even though anger is a valid and natural emotion for everyone, regardless of their gender. This inner coding that tells a woman that she's less of one because she feels a certain way, while a man isn't told anything at all, is just another way that the good girl complex and its expected behaviors hurt women. Because it's pretty much exclusively harming us. It may seem pointless or nonsensical to make something out of a two-word phrase most people don't use maliciously anyway. The impacts of what being called a good girl does aren't that obvious either, right? But visible or not, they are there. And because of the mentality that this phrase perpetuates, that women should be serving others, even a woman's success and their leadership is defined in a biased way. The Harvard Business Review analyzed a study exploring the words used to describe both male and female leaders who had pretty much the exact same performances best on a set list of their measures. Their analysis found that the positive word most commonly used to describe men was analytical, while for women, it was compassionate. 
Even though both genders' performances were pretty much the same, they were obviously characterized differently. Being analytical is a testament to a person's work ethic or their strategic skill, while being compassionate speaks more to how you treat others in the workplace. It's not necessarily negative, but not exactly praise about your professional capability either. And that's how women are being defined today. Not only as different from a man who did the same work they did, but yet again, just by how good they serve others. The main problem is that now, without even realizing it, women and little girls are growing up associating being called a good girl and the validation they get from it with being quiet, with taking a step back, with putting their own dreams on the back burner just to help with someone else's. And as we get older, we start to do things to please other people because we think that we're going to get the same praise and validation we so desperately crave if we do. And it doesn't help that this phrase isn't exactly one that's dwelled on. It's used pretty frequently and lightly, like the replacement for a thank you at the end of a sentence after a woman does something good for someone else in their life. But despite its very common use, this phrase carries with it a heavy weight. Why are we only being called good girls when we follow someone else's instructions? Give up an argument or concede something that we really want, or when we just shut up, sit still, and look pretty. Of course, it might not be intentional, but regardless, the use of this phrase only at very specific people-pleasing times can push girls into smaller boxes, into taking up less space, into cowering or hovering in the corner of a room just because they want to be called good. Because what happens when women try to break through the ceiling of this good box? Well, as evidenced by the 2016 United States presidential election, when former President Donald Trump called former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton a nasty woman during their third presidential debate, people get mad. And suddenly, we aren't even good when we do something good for ourselves, but we aren't even powerful or assertive or any of the things a man would be called for doing the exact same thing. Apparently, we're just bad. So we refrain from even putting our hands up and trying to push on the confines of the good ceiling over our heads because now the reality is we're absolutely terrified about what could happen if we really do break through and all those shards of good girl glass rain down on us. We don't want to be called of or even thought of as bad, so we just stay on the good side of things. The good girl complex does not make any sense. Serving other people and putting their needs over yours is not behavior that should be associated with any positive word. And objectively speaking, women aren't any less good because they're assertive or because they want to learn to be. We know that as women, we have every capability and right to be powerful in leadership positions and to speak about how we feel. Because it's true. When you think about it, there is no real reason at all that justifies keeping women locked up in an invisible cage of societal standards at all. But after years of getting used to feeling guilty for being human, this can be hard for women to believe. How could we possibly think it's okay to break our good girl ceiling? How do we get the confidence to be a Taylor Swift in a world full of scooter brawns? It seems unfathomable, especially when, as Time's Up now reported, a fourth of coverage on current and first ever U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris's performance during the vice presidential debate didn't even reference any of her professional qualifications as a female politician, instead saying that she was uncooperative and too ambitious, feeding into the expectations of what a good girl apparently shouldn't be. It seems terrifying to stop acting like a good girl. On a widespread scale, the consequences can include being canceled like countless female celebrities have been over the years for no good reason. And on a personal level, can include having to have negative and difficult conversations with people who might not really get it. But as the Miss Americana Netflix documentary showed us, it is so important and so rewarding. So what can we all do to make it a little bit easier to rewrite 
this narrative. The first thing is awareness. This complex and how many women feel as a result of it may be unfortunately so normalized, but they are still so real and so present. To a wide range of extents, this complex and the societal expectations on women can and probably have impacted all of us, including me. In order to do something about it, we need to know that it's real and it's happening. The reality is we are being put in situations where we are inherently invalidated on the basis of our gender, and this can impact how we are being treated. This isn't okay by any means, but it's something we have to acknowledge, swallow, and work on. So making sure that we recognize our feelings are there and that this phrase makes us feel a certain way is so important. Second, we need to validate and affirm how we feel. We as women deserve to have and feel every feeling under the sun and do what we need to do to make ourselves happy. Even if the only reason we have for our actions is to help us nurture and care for our own well-being. We have no reason to feel guilty for being mad or by being hurt by someone else's actions or for feeling like we deserve more than we're getting at the moment. All of the emotions that can rise to our surface should be felt, expressed, and embraced. Not hidden, pushed away, and ridiculed. It sounds silly, but it's true. Women should be proud of themselves for having emotions in a reaction to any situation. For being able to put their foot down and say no. And for being amazing leaders. But third, and probably most daunting of all, we need to act on it. Obviously, the most difficult step. It's really easy to say a lot of this, to come up and give a speech, or to even double tap affirmation posts we see while scrolling through our Instagram feed and to manifest being assertive, but actually doing something tangible about it, terrifying. But this doesn't mean that we should just leave it alone. Getting rid of layers upon layers of entrenched societal expectations and working on becoming somebody everybody tells you you can't be is beyond hard. But that's okay. It's a learning curve that every woman can and should work on. The initial first step can feel like punching through the roof of that glass ceiling. Hard, painful, uncertain, and it might cause a bunch of emotional scars. All the fear and anxiety that comes with standing up for yourself for the first time. But eventually, it's just about letting those scars heal over time. And this will get easier and easier and easier. But on top of working on it on a personal level, unpacking this complex is also about recognizing how our own actions can hurt other women in our lives. What harmful stigmas do we hold that make us view a woman's personal choices differently and negatively without any valid reason or basis? We should reevaluate how we want to uplift other women. Instead of judging a girl at school based on a rumor you offhandedly heard or even criticizing a female politician for being too angry, we need to stop and think. Is what they're doing actually hurtful and wrong? Or is it just contradicting what we've been told is acceptable for women? And again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with thinking things through slowly and doing things like, for example, taking time when speaking to someone to make sure that you're responding from a genuine place and an unbiased place of care and support instead of lashing out and acting on your behaviors by saying things you can't take back. The good girl complex is, in fact, very complex. It won't be undone overnight, and while that's definitely not ideal, that's completely okay. The most important thing is that we, and all women, begin to recognize what being good should really mean. It shouldn't be acting and hiding your real feelings to seem more good on the outside, and it certainly should not mean just being good for other people. Being good should really mean being good and true to yourself. Thank you.
Today, our speakers' talks indeed embodies Ted's mission of ideas worth spreading and celebrated the incredible women that make up our GIST community. One thing which we can all take away from today is that although there are many glass ceilings that inhibit women in society, we must actively seek and exercise solutions to support women in our fight to reduce gender inequality and to be more inclusive of all voices. You are absolutely right, Roberto, and I hope all of you agree with me. Today's talks were truly inspirational and provided me with many ideas I've never thought about in depth. Our speakers have shown you all that women, including myself, can break through our glass ceilings that come our way. And although it is a very, very challenging process, we can do it. Once again, thank you to Miyake, Sophia Malika, Nyla, Mrs. Cowley, and Alex for being speakers at today's event. Please give them a round of applause. Finally, we'd like to give our gratitude to, to the TOCO for sponsoring this event. Also, thank you to Ms. Davis, Ibu Myra, GIST IT and AV team, Deva, custodian staff, and last but not least, our wonderful club advisor, Mr. Clark, and the many student organizers. We look forward to seeing you all at our next TEDx Youth at GIST event, but until, but until then, keep coming up with ideas worth spreading and shatter your glass ceilings. Thank you. Thank you. about myself again but you you signed up for this i do my hair toss check my nails baby how you feeling hair toss check my nails baby how you feeling
pillow off the pavement You walk me to the car And you know I wanna ask you to dance right there In the middle of the parking lot down the road I wonder if you know I'm trying so hard not to get caught up now but you're just so cool when your hands through your hair absentmindedly making me want you and I don't know how it gets better than this you take my hand and drive me head first fearless and I don't know Drive slow.